Hello everybody. In 2018, Professor John Elkington, for many the godfather of sustainability, in an article of the Harvard Business Review proposed the recall of the triple bottom line. In his piece, he highlights the need to rethink how we manage the systematic effects of human activities on our planet. In August of this year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC for short, issued Code Red for Humanity. The report reads in part, unless there are immediate, rapid and large-scale reductions on greenhouse gases, limiting warming to less than 1.5 degrees or even 2 degrees Celsius will be beyond reach. In October of the same year, One Earth published the work carried out by the German Aerospace Center, the University Technology of Sydney and the University of Melbourne. Together, they modeled a net zero carbon emitting energy system. The report highlights the need to invest 1.5 trillion annually to keep the global temperatures below 1.5. The authors explain that just a third is being currently invested and that investments such as in sustainable agriculture are not even considered. Also in October, the Forum for the Future, in their case for action, call for a transition to a trust and regenerative industry that advocates a visionary approach rather, just, rather than just an engineering. Alarm bells all over. But what is it that our current agri-food industry delivers? Well, since industrialization began, the agri-food industry has been designed to achieve highest productivity. Today, this industry produces enough calories for 10 billion people hypothetically already. However, these calories come at a tremendous cost to the planetary and human health. More than one third of what is being produced is wasted. And a significant portion ends up in already full stomachs. Seven out of 10 people in one way or the other suffer from what they eat. Without change, every year 5.5 million people will lose their lives on non-communicable diseases such as diabetes and others, plus starvation, by 2030. All human activities combined in this industry contribute to about one-third of all admitted greenhouse gases. Approximately 70% of all fresh waters are used to irrigate crops and water livestock. 77% of arable land is needed to feed our domesticated animals. In return, they supply us with just 17% of all calories that we consume. We know that there are hundreds of thousands of plants and crops, insects and animals edible, yet we only use 12 crops and five animals to make more than 75% of our foods. Together, the three crops account for more than 60% of all calories and insanely, concentrated global machinery that took away markets from farming communities and thereby depriving them from crop rotations and other much more sustainable farming practices at scale. These few crops are enormously resource demanding. To yield profitably, they want best soils, inputs and crop protection chemicals, soils that are often only found after deforestation. Every minute we witness the loss of areas of biological significance the size of 30 soccer fields. At the same time, these crops empty the land they grow on and degrade soils 35 times faster than ever recorded in human history. Every minute, 23 soccer fields are lost to degradation, leaving 2.6 billion people with more than a half of their assets unproductive behind. A disaster for about 74% of them because they are already the most vulnerable. They are the poorest of the poor and hit the hardest. Rising sea levels, violent storms, raging fires, droughts and soil irrigation, all effects of a changing climate. And it will displace hundreds of millions of climate change refugees. It needs more than $1.5 trillion per year to buffer the worst. It's a lot of money. Yet over the past two years, 
16 trillion have saved millions from COVID-19. Given that hundreds of millions are threatened, it doesn't seem to be too big an ask to invest $1.5 trillion on an annual basis and more. Don't we have to ask ourselves, why should we sustain something that produces such bad results? Of course, it doesn't make sense, but how to change a global industry with billions of people relying on it? A very, very difficult proposition. Yet, at the core of the cha challenge is the massive loss of biodiversity and indeed agrobiodiversity, both accelerators of the Holocene, the sixth mass extinction. Therefore, it is undeniably time to think regeneration. But what does that mean and how do we start? How do we get going? Josie Warden, head of regenerative design at the Royal Society of Arts, Manufacturers and Commerce, describes a regenerative mindset as one that sees the world as a living system, built around reciprocal and co-evolutionary relationships where humans, other living beings and ecosystems relying on one another for health. Such mindsets must celebrate the complexity of biological systems, as well as the diversity all around us. It is a mindset that desires a more vigorous life in natural ecosystems, communities, as well as for that matter in an entire industry. To start a regenerative agri-food revolution, I propose to invent, to invite consumers to participate in the discovery of new crops and new ingredients alike. Don't we all know that Homo sapiens thrive when we eat a well-diverse diet? Loads of plants, tubers, fruits, veggies, nuts, and the occasional animal protein as well as insects made our ancestors strong and resilient. Let us take consumers on a journey to forgotten crops let us make it exciting, accessible, affordable and convenient so that their friends and families start having fun exploring different colors, new textures and new flavors. While these consumers are indulging in a diverse diet, they soon will benefit from their change. These diverse nutrients not only enter our metabolic system straight away, but also feed the good bacteria in our microbiomes and therefore help reduce inflammation and increase in general our well-being with every purchasing decision a consumer makes. A domino stone is kicked over. Every bite of a product that celebrates the regeneration, a demand is created and the more demand we can aggregate, the larger the markets become for farmers to supply those once forgotten crops into. Imagine if these crops are selected for the capacity to regenerate farms, helping entire communities to grow them on land that otherwise doesn't produce an income for them anymore. Or what if such crops can be used as a cover crop, intercrop, following crop, without tilling, helping us to keep carbon in the soils and to sequester even more. Think of the financial rewards of harvesting fruits of such crops, while other parts help microorganisms to fixate nitrogen. Think of the benefits of the organic matter deep down at the root systems where other organisms can come alive and help build healthy soil structures which in return increase water retention capacities for such lands. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, we, who are otherwise social animals, have been asked to stay at home and physically distance from one another. Such rather unnatural behavior has increased general anxiety among us, as well as decreased our collective mental well-being. Because of that, and many other reasons, our sense, our senses have become numb to the natural world around us. How many times do we find ourselves immersed in the virtual reality while just passing by a flowering plant 
without noticing its beauty. Our senses need to reconnect to nature and communities alike. Without those bonds and relationships, we find it difficult to empathize with one another. Visualize what would happen if regulators would come together to demand a radical shift away from the reliance on just few crops to a regenerative system where crops in the hundreds deliver the nutrients we need. Imagine if we would move to a financial accounting system whereby the true costs of the agrofood industry is being taken into consideration. Costs such as human and planetary health, as well as the health of wildlife and, wild and livestock. What if we would agree to have two kids, two young adults from every country on this planet to help monitor the implementation of such change? Because at the end of the day, it is the youth and their children and grandchildren who are going to be hit the hardest by the hostility of a world that is hotter than it is today. Personally, I struggle to see a bright future unless we rally behind the Sustainable Development Goal number 15. Life on land asks us to protect, restore and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, and hold and reverse land degradation, and hold biodiversity loss for good. Without succeeding here, we will be struggling to eliminate poverty, hunger, will be difficult to achieve greater well-being, equality, education for all, clean water, and many more. Let us work together to protect the regeneration for the powerful possibilities it holds. Let us strive to bring back an agrobiodiversity we need to sink more carbon in our soils, to grow a rich basket of many different crops, to create exciting nutrient-dense products, and to reconnect to communities, both consumers and farmers alike, so that they prosper within a life-affirming purpose. Regeneration must not become the new management tool or be misused for greenwashing. Regenerative leaders need to create an environment for others to succeed in delivering a life-affirming future where win-win is the norm and not the exemption. To illustrate how interconnected everything is on this planet, I would like to conclude with a simple Gedanken experiment, as Albert Einstein called it. In every breath we take, we inhale more molecules than there are breaths in our atmosphere. Therefore, with enough time, the oxygen we inhale today has been made in a plant's photosynthesis using a carbon dioxide molecule that was once exhaled by, say, Queen Cleopatra. On that idea, I wish to propose that sustainability is not enough. It is time to regenerate. Join the regeneration. Thank you.